so uh, so then only i should start na a very good afternoon a very hearty and warm welcome to you all in this popular talk series being organized by department of physics women's college agartala tripura before starting this auspicious occasion i fold my hands before the light that brings prosperity auspiciousness good health abundance of wealth and destruction of the enemy's intellect i fold my hands before the lord the maintainer of this creation in the form of this light i adore this light which destroys all the pains resulting from my omissions and commissions today in this session we are highly delighted by the kind presence of shrimati manidipa dev verma principal women's college agartala tripura as the president of this session we have with us our respected teachers from various department of the college we are extremely delighted with the gracious presence of our resource person the extremely talented speaker for the day and last but not the least we are more than overwhelmed by the presence of all the participants from across the globe who have always cooperated with us from the very beginning once again i heartily welcome you all in this session now i would request dr shubhrata dev assistant professor hod department of physics women's college agartala as well as the organizing secretary of this talk series to deliver the welcome address please sir uh sir just uh, put um, put your mic off on hello am i audible yeah, yes sir yes sir you are audible So, respected principal speaker for the day, Professor Philip Moriarty, School of Physics and Astronomy, University of Nottingham, United Kingdom, respected president, Srimati Manini Padar Burma, principal madam, Women's College, dear colleagues, and my dear students, a very good afternoon to all of you. In this virtual platform, I am very much happy to inform all concerned that this popular talk series has been initiated by the Department of Physics of Women's College with a aim to boost and motivate the young students of UG and PG level, teachers community of this region and to provide an unique opportunity to create a platform for interaction between eminent academicians and researchers. highly reputed in their fields in this tough period arising out due to the imposition of sudden lockdown due to outbreak of covid-19 first talk of this series was delivered by dr sachin p nanavati of school of chemistry cardiff university united kingdom and his talk was on computational sciences perspective and future opportunity on 3rd january 2022 and the second talk of this series was delivered by dr chitra mandal sir distinguished fellow of indian institute of chemical biology kolkata on 21st january 2022 she talked on scientific contributions for the management of covid-19 this is the third and the final talk of this series on behalf of organizing secretary and on my own behalf it is my duty to welcome professor philip moriarty of school of physics and astronomy university of nottingham uk for his kind consent to deliver this popular talk despite of being his hectic schedule thank you very much sir professor moriarty will be talking on the topic the particle in a box is not simple which will be a very interesting talk for ug and pg level students of physics and chemistry so in this context it will be my humble request 
to all my dear students of physics and chemistry to listen to his lecture and put forward questions if you have any. I am also to welcome Srimati Manidipada Burma, principal and also the president of this talk series, who is always acting as a catalyst to motivate young faculty members like us to organize such kinds of lecture workshops, seminars, webinars, conferences, and fiction. Thank you very much, Madam, for your kind support following. In this context, I am also to welcome all the persons who are working behind the scenes, like Mrs. Sarvarinath, Dr. K.V. Gita, Technical Coordinator, Srimati Pushparang Ankhul, my departmental colleagues, all the members of organizing committee, and our fifth semester student, Ms. Ipsisa Ghosh. They are all very much supportive and motivating following. At the end, I am to request all the participants, especially to my dear students, to listen to Professor Moriarty sir in this, uh, which is the most important part of this talk. You were very much supportive in the previous two lectures, and I hope that your presence in this talk will definitely provide us the strength in the coming days to organize such kind of program for the benefit of the students so be there, it is a program of nearly one and a half hour or so. So don't leave the program at all. Thank you all once again and have a good day. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thanks for always being so supportive. Now the presidential address will be delivered by our respected principal, Madam, Srimati Mani Dipade Burma. Principal Women's College, Agartala. Please, madam. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Respected research person, Professor Philip Moriarty, School of Physics and Astronomy, University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. Faculty members, academicians, my colleagues, and my dear students. Good afternoon to all. It is my immense pleasure to welcome you all in this popular lecture on the particle in a box is not so simple. Organized by Department of Physics, Women's College, Agartala, Tripura. We are extremely delighted to have with us Professor Philip Moriarty of University of Nottingham UK, sir, I, on behalf of Women's College and on my own behalf, heartily welcome you in this program. I welcome all faculties, research scholars, and students from different parts of the country who are joining us through StreamYard. Our college was established in 1965, and it is the first college for women in Tripura imparting quality education exclusively for women. During the last two years, we were compelled to adopt online programs and our college have conducted many webinars, popular lectures during this time. Department of Physics has conducted popular talk series consisting of three lectures by eminent professors, scientists of our country and abroad. Today is the third lecture in the series on the particle in a box is not so simple by Professor Philip Moriarty of University of Nottingham. I once again would like to extend my heartiest gratitude to you, sir, for accepting our invitation to deliver lectures on this topic. The main objective of this talk is to create awareness among the students about the recent scope of research as well as to give an idea of the ongoing research in the field of physical science. Besides, students can get a platform to interact with the eminent person in the field of science and technology. We are eagerly waiting to listen to Professor Philip Moriarty's lecture. And with these few words, I once again would like to welcome Professor Philip Moriarty and you all. I am sure his lecture 
on the same topic will enlighten us, especially scholars and students of this discipline will be highly benefited. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, madam. Thanks for always motivating us to do the best things. Uh, for the last two decades, it has been observed that there is a slow decline in the number of enrollment of students in undergraduate science subjects. It affects both quality as well as quantity of students pursuing higher education. This is primarily due to the shrinkage in the job and future scope of education and research. Conducting such a popular talk series will make a positive change in the mindset of both students and the teacher community. Main objective of this popular talk series are creating awareness among the students regarding possible scope of research in the field of physical sciences, highlighting the scope of future education to elucidate the various ongoing research topics, create a platform for the students to interact with the eminent person in the field of science and technology, facilitate opportunities for networking, collaborations and exchange of ideas with eminent academician of the nation and abroad, to boost young researchers and faculty members towards research and development, and now, this is the time for the much awaited session where the extremely talented resource person will share his valuable words in this talk series. We have with us Professor Philip Moriarty, School of Physics and Astronomy, University of Nottingham, UK. Philip Moriarty is a professor of physics and an engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, established Career Fellow 2020 to 2025 at the University of Nottingham. His research focuses on pushing, pulling, prodding, and poking single atoms and molecules using scanning probe microscopes operating under ultra high vacuum and low temperature conditions. He has a particularly keen current interest in integrating machine learning with atomic resolution imaging, although he also complements his microscopy under, sorry, microscopy work with synchrotron-based spectroscopy and analysis. Moriarty's first pop science book, When the Uncertainty Principle Goes to 11, Ben Villa 2018, was shortlisted for the Physics World's Book of the Year 2018. He blogs at Symptoms of the Universe. Today, we are very fortunate to have Sir with us. So please, platform is all yours. Thank you so much. Before I share, start sharing the slides, I'd just like to say thank you um, for all the organizers, particularly Dr. Deb, for the invitation. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. The talk is actually going to be a balance, well, I hope, between teaching and research, particularly um, the year before last, um, so the first year of the lockdown, as it was, I started teaching our core second year quantum mechanics module, which we call the quantum world. And there were aspects of research, as I'll tell you, as you've just heard, and as I'll tell you about, we use scanning probe microscopes. So they allow us to resolve individual atoms and individual molecules. Indeed, the state of the art is to see inside molecules and see the overall chemical structure, but also to arrange atoms, to arrange molecules, to build up structures atom by atom. And of course, that has essential and um, extremely far reaching implications for uh, not just research in quantum mechanics, but also for teaching quantum mechanics. So. Um, you know, things that were Gedanken experiments, thought experiments, even just 30, 40 years ago are now not only within reach or something that are that is done almost on a daily basis in some some laboratories in the world. So what I hope to get across in this talk is that blend between teaching and research. And that's when, you know, the best teaching happens is when it's informed by the most recent research. So once again, thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, 
obviously I, I can see on, on I've not used StreamYard before, but I can see that there's a, a comments section over there. If you want to leave comments over there, of course, there'll be a and a session at the end. But during the talk, I'll try and keep an eye on that. And if there are comments coming up there, I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer them as I'm going along. OK, I will start sharing my screen. Which is that one. OK, so the talk, as you can see, is called The Particle in a Box is Not So Simple. As you know, um, undergraduates and postgraduates, and well, all of us who have done physics, a particle in a box model is core to so much of what we do uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, it's where we start off. So it could be considered quantum physics 101, as it were. However, there are many subtleties in the particle in a box, and it's not so surprising that undergraduates get very, very confused in terms of what's going on in, in the particle in a box model and get very, very confused from that because they see the particle in a box as, as the ground level and they think, well, if I'm not understanding this, how am I going to understand all this other stuff? But the problem is the particle in a box itself has some very interesting subtleties and um, conceptual challenges. The alternative title to, for this talk is, as you can see, The Many Worlds of Quantum Tuition. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to focus on the research in the first side, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on the teaching side in the second half. Um, as was mentioned, um, just uh, down here, you can see this um, link. That's to a blog where I, I use that blog extensively when I'm teaching the module for simulations, some of which I'll also use in this talk. Um, and for various different um, aspects of the course alongside the, the, the notes, of course, and the videos. Okay. Is it going to let me there? Gone. Okay, so just to let you know where Nottingham is. So Nottingham is, is pretty central in the UK. Hopefully you can see this. Um, and I'm actually not from Nottingham. This is not a Nottingham accent. This is an Irish accent. I'm from over here pretty close to the border between Northern Ireland and, and um, uh, so the Republic of Ireland. I've been in Nottingham, however, since 1994. I've been a long time in Nottingham. I've lived in Nottingham longer than I lived in Ireland, so I've spent quite some time here. So Nottingham is probably most famous for Sherwood Forest and this guy, <laughs> Robin Hood. For physicists, however, and mathematicians, what's less well-known is that it's also, or was also, the home of George Green. So of Green's functions fame. So Green's functions are incredibly important through a wide range of different aspects of physics, including, of course, quantum mechanics. And Green was a miller here in Nottingham in a place called Snanton. So we do have our um, popular culture links, but we also have our very strong links to, to physics and mathematical physics in particular. Before I start talking about the research, I really have to do this. And I like to get these people up front because these are the, or at least some of the people, you know, contributed to the work in the group over the years. Um, the uh, who Some of whom have gone on to lectureships. Adam here, for example, and Sam and indeed Philip Rye have all gone on to who are postdocs in the group. Students and postdocs in the group have gone on to lectureships. Um, everybody else in here, well, not quite everybody else, but a number of, of other people in here have gone on to careers both inside academia and um, outside academia. We also collaborate um, with this guy, Lev Kantarovic at King's College London. And my colleague now, Jeanette, who's retired, has also contributed to this work. But there are a wide range of different people who worked very hard to contribute to this work. And I'm always very keen at the start to give those people the credit that, that they deserve. Okay, we're at the point now where, as I said, you know, experiments that were Gedanken thought experiments even a few decades ago are now almost routine in the lab. This is from 1990. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this. It's a phenomenal piece of work. It was instrumental in my case for me going on to do a PhD because I was absolutely blown away by this, this work back in 1990. I started my PhD in September 1990. This paper was published a few months beforehand. And um, 
It's individual xenon atoms. Each blob here is a single xenon atom on a nickel surface. And then they've moved those atoms around. And I'll tell you how they move those atoms around soon. But they move those atoms around, as you can see, to spell out the IBM logo in individual atoms. Um, and, you know, if you work out that you can move atoms around, a very good thing to do is to spell out the name of the company that employs you. That's a very clever and canny thing to do. Now, that's atomic manipulation. So really, this was the first paper on, on single atom manipulation uh, with, with a microscope called a scanning probe microscope, which I'll, I'll tell you about very soon. But um, where it's progressed to now, and hopefully this video will work, is, and this was again, so this was back in 2013, so that even this is almost a decade old now. Um, but this is beautiful. This is what I'm, let me, before I play it, what I'm about to show you is what's been billed as the world's smallest movie. So it's a, what's called a stop motion movie, whereby they m manipulate. In this, case, not, in this case, not atoms, although it says these are atoms. They are atoms, but it's actually a molecule. It's a CO molecule. It's a carbon and an oxygen atom. And what you're going to see is a movie whereby they've taken an image, then they've moved a molecule, then they've taken another image, then they've moved a molecule, and they've painstakingly done that over and over again. And it's called A Boy and His Atom. It's on very easy to find it on YouTube if you just... Google for a boy and his atom, you'll find this. And it's a stunning example of the level of control we have at the atomic and molecular level now. I don't know if you can hear the music. I can hear the music. It's um, either soothing or irritating, depending on your pr perspective. One thing I will point out now. Before I let this go, you see these ripples, these ripples everywhere. This is quantum mechanics in action. What you are seeing there are the ripples, the probability density of the electron waves at this particular surface. It's a copper, a particular type of surface called a copper 111 surface. I know not all of you will have done solid state at this stage. For those of you who have done solid state physics, 111. Uh, it relates to the, the Miller indices or are the Miller indices. For those of you who haven't done solid state, basically when we say 111 or 100 or 110 or whatever, you come across this soon in solid state physics, but it's basically just a way of labeling different planes in a crystal. And it relates to how we cut through a crystal to expose those particular planes. For this particular surface, which is Copper 111, it's also much the same for gold 111 and for silver 111. Um, the electrons at that surface form, in, a, in essence, a two-dimensional electron gas. So the, where we start off in solid state physics and sort of the um, also covered, of course, in quantum mechanics courses, um, is the, the free electron model, where the electrons are free to move in space without any constraints. That's pretty much what we have here until those electron waves encounter an obstacle and then they scatter and they reflect just like a classical wave will do. That's what you're seeing. So keep an eye on how those waves change and the patterns change as they as the, the movie goes on goes goes ahead. You see here in particular, you've got a line and you can see that the ripples, it's it's a step basically. And you're seeing a step potential and you're seeing the ripples of the electron waves. Similarly here, all the scattering, all the interference. So beautiful, really, really beautiful, really elegant. And as you can see there, this link to see how the movie was made. It's This is from um, Andreas Heinrich's group. Uh, again, IBM. IBM really set the bar in terms of scanning probe microscopy. The first um, 
microscope of the type that's used to do this imaging and manipulation was invented at IBM and they've really um, pioneered so many in innovations associated with the technique. So it's a microscope like no other. What do I mean by that? In terms of seeing individual atoms and individual molecules, if we try to do that with a typical light microscope, an optical microscope, we've got a major issue because atoms and molecules are much, much smaller than the wavelength of visible light. We hit the diffraction limit pretty quickly, so we're not going to be able to see individual atoms and molecules using a traditional technique. You can, of course, go to an electron microscope and very powerful um, state-of-the-art and transmission electron microscopes um, allow you to, um, to see individual atoms. However, what you don't have is the ability to do what I've just shown you in that movie, to target individual atoms and molecules and to move them around. The microscope that allows you that capability, both an imaging and a manipulation capability, is called the scanning probe microscope. And this is, a, this is what we'd like to think as the ideal as we've got this wonderfully sharp probe that we bring in close to a surface and move it back and forth. And we measure some type of interaction or some type of force, in fact, force gradient. And from that, we can, um, if the tip is atomically sharp, we can then resolve single atoms, single molecules at the surface. Now, this is not quite an artist's impression. All the coordinates of the atoms here are taken from a, um, what's called a density functional theory, a quantum chemistry, basically, um, calculation, simulation. So it, it's real in that sense. Uh, the ray tracing makes it very pretty. But ask yourself, do shadows at the atomic level really make a lot of sense? It makes the image look pretty, but physically is possibly not the, um, the most uh, valid. Um, my colleague now, so Sam was, a, as I mentioned before, was a PhD student in the group, then a, a fellow in the group and is now a lecturer at Lancaster University. So he put this together exactly a, a decade ago. So I, I, I need to give credit to him for this. But that's in essence what we have. That's what a microscope is. No lenses, no optics, no mirrors. We have a probe and our probe that allows us to do the imaging and allows us to do the manipulation is the sharp tip. Ultimately, what we'd really like to have is to have a, a, an individual atom sticking out the end. I say ultimately, this is we can we can do this, and many scanning probes across the the world routinely get atomically sharp tips. However, it takes a lot of effort sometimes to get the tip in a state where it's got one single atom at the end. So. The essential idea here is tip surface. You bring the tip in and use the tip as a probe of the surface. The first version of the scanning probe microscopes, as they're called, was the scanning tunneling microscope. And it's called the scanning tunneling microscope because it exploits the tunneling phenomena that you're familiar with from, from um, sorry, tunneling phenomena, phenomenon <laughs> that you're singular, tunneling phenomenon that you're um, familiar with in quantum physics in that we have a barrier for electrons and that barrier in this case is formed by the vacuum between the tip and the sample. So the gap between the tip and the sample is of order a little less than a nanometer. The tip and the sample aren't in electrical contact, but because they're so close, electrons can tunnel from the tip to the sample or vice versa from the sample on the to the tip, depending on the polarity. And as you scan the tip back and forth across the surface, that um, tunnel current, that quantum mechanical tunnel current will vary and it will vary on the atomic scale, allowing you to see individual atoms, individual molecules, and as we're going to see, quantum waves, probability density. In essence, and to a reasonable first approximation, there are lots of provisors, but to a reasonable first approximation, what the STM image, what the scanning tunneling microscope is showing you is the probability density at the surface. There are lots of provisors there, but as I say, to a first approximation, that's what it is. How does it work? Well, it's a mixture of fairly sophisticated technology and fairly, um, how can I put it? common technology, although it mightn't seem like that. So over here in the UK, I'm sure you have them possibly maybe where you are as well. We have um, lighters 
Um, they can either, they used to be cigarette lighters, but they're also um, lighters for barbecues, for example, over here, whereby you have um, uh, a rod and you can press the end of that rod and a spark appears at the other end of that rod. Inside those, is uh, what's known as a piezoelectric crystal. So this is something which, when you distort it, generates a large voltage across it. And that voltage can be, and is, for those barbecue lighters, of the order of kilovolts, sometimes 10 to 15 kilovolts. And that's large enough to break down air, so you get a spark. In a scanning probe microscope, you turn that idea on its head. You apply a voltage to one of these crystals to get them to distort. And if you have good quality crystals, rather better than those you might use in the barbecue lighter, um, and you have good electronics, in particular, you have low noise, um, high voltage electronics, that allows you to control the, um, the distortion of the crystal right down to not just the atomic level, but to the level of picometers, so hundredths of an atomic diameter. And if you stick a tip on the end of this actuator, of this piezoelectric actuator, you can move it back and forth. And if that tip is atomically sharp, as I said, then you can see individual atoms. And as I said as well, you can manipulate those individual atoms. There are other mechanisms as well as probing the, the tunneling current and the quantum mechanical tunneling current. You can also measure the force gradient between the atom at the end of the tip and the surface. And I'm not going to go into just the details of how we do that. If you want to know about that, please get in touch. I can send you links to various um, aspects of that, including some videos we've made um, about just how that works. Not just us, we and others have made. Including this. Now, this is for a YouTube channel called 60 Symbols. Let me tell you about 60 Symbols just very briefly because you might find some of the stuff there interesting. So uh, before I get back to that particular video. So 60 Symbols is a collaboration between this guy, a guy called Brady Harron, and ourselves here at Nottingham uh, School of Physics and Astronomy. Now, Brady used to be a BBC uh, video journalist. He's been an independent YouTuber. Um, for oh, over 10 years now. His first major sort of success was um, something called Periodic Videos. His most popular channel now is something called Number File, which is, I don't know, approaching probably, I haven't checked it in a long while, but it's probably approaching something like 4 million subscribers. Um, Computer File is also very popular, well over uh, 2 million subscribers. The physics version of these channels, so you can probably guess what number files about. You can probably guess what computer files about. You can probably guess what periodic videos is about. So it's about this is a chemistry channel. This is a maths channel. This is a computing channel. And the physics channel is 60 symbols. And a number of us here in physics and astronomy at Nottingham collaborate uh, regularly with Brady to make a range of different videos on a range of different topics. Um, and you can, this is actually from quite some time ago. We started off being funded for 60 videos, hence 60 symbols. Uh, they, those, 60, those 60 videos went well and we continue to be funded and we continue to make these videos. So I think at this stage, we're up to something like 350 different videos covering everything from, oh, for example, you might be able to guess what this is and from a quantum mechanics perspective in terms of Schrodinger's cat, um, we also, one of the more popular videos is what happens if you put your hand inside the beam of the Large Hadron Collider. Um, range, as you can see, relativity here. There's lots in terms of um, pretty much every aspect of physics covered there, including quantum mechanics and including nanoscience. This is the most recent video. So we are um, very happy just before Christmas at the end of 2021, to install a new high magnetic field scanning tunneling atomic force micro microscope. So this is a, a microscope that allows you to both do the scanning tunneling um, imaging that I've discussed, but also in parallel with that, allow you to do atomic force where you measure the force directly um, between the, the tip and the sample that allows you to probe the force between an atom at the tip and an atom at the sample. And 
so this this goes up to quite a high magnetic field, up to nine Tesla, um, and also cools. We can cool it down to three hundred millikelvin. So that's zero point three Kelvin, which I like, as I like to say, is a tenth um, of the uh, temperature of the the universe in terms of the cosmic microwave background, as you may know, is 2.7 K. Um, now, that's still a very, very hot temperature compared to my um, colleagues, um, very, very high temperature compared to my colleagues who work in Bose-Einstein condensates who routinely get down to nano Kelvin. But for us, 300 milli Kelvin is, is, is pretty cold and it allows us to do experiments we've not been able to do uh, before here in Nottingham. We, of course, are not the only group in the world to have an instrument like this. There are about 10 or 12 other um, instruments like this particular one across the world. But this is the first one in the UK. So we're, we're very happy about that. So, yeah, so if you want to um, if you want to find out more about what's actually happening in the labs here and to actually see a sort of almost have a virtual tour of the lab, you could look up this video on um, Google, just 60 symbols unboxing a, a microscope and, and you'll get it. So this is work from quite some time ago. It'll give you a flavor of the type of thing we've done in terms of atomic manipulation. We continue to do experiments along these lines, but with I'll tell you about the more recent stuff soon, but this was um, an experiment that um, we were very happy worked, let's put it that way. Or what we wanted to do here was to, um, through chemical force alone, so what we do is we bring the tip in, we interact with an atom at a surface, we bond with it, and we pull up, and we change the orientation of the, the atom, and then we um, remove the tip. And, of course, if you can do that, what you've effectively got is the smallest version of a, a switch, smallest electromechanical device you can have. On silicon surfaces, we're fortunate. This is a side-on view, so we're looking at the tip side-on. We're looking at the uppermost atoms at the surface side-on. On silicon surfaces, actually, if I go back, that's what this particular surface is. We have rows, in this particular silicon surface, we have rows of, of atoms which pair up. So you can see maybe one of the pairs here. So there's an up atom and a down atom. This particular surface, the atoms pair into dimers, and then those dimers in turn do what we call buckle, to do a process which we call buckling, in that one atom moves up and another atom moves down. And so nature is very, very kind to us. It gives us effectively equivalent of uh, an atomic switch without us having to do the work in, in creating it. So you get these rows of, of dimers, and then what we can do, as I said, bring the tip in, interact with it, pull it up, move back. And then if we label this as a one and label this as a zero, we've got uh, in principle um, binary information storage. Now, I need to stress, and sometimes this is not stressed enough in the nanoscience scanning probe atomic manipulation communities, this is happening at a temperature of 4.2 degrees, liquid helium temperature uh, um, above absolute zero, in an ultra high vacuum. So a vacuum comparable to that you'd get on the surface of the moon. And we need to work in those conditions because we want to have atomically clean, atomically flat surfaces. If you take a silicon crystal and crack it open in air within nanoseconds, picoseconds, um, it's going to be covered in contamination because that surface will react with oxygen and everything else that's in the air and in the surrounding environment. So what we do is we put everything in a big vacuum system, which is what this is, hidden away behind all this tinfoil. A very common question is, why do you cover everything in tinfoil? And the reason it's covered in tinfoil, and if you ever see videos of CERN or particle um, accelerators, you'll, you'll also see a lot of tinfoil in the background usually. A key contaminant in these systems after we pump them is water. Water, molecular thin, molecularly thin films of water sit on the, the stainless steel surfaces in the vacuum. And if we don't get rid of that water, it just sits there for a very long time, years, and just gradually comes off the walls, uh, evaporates off the walls and pollutes the vacuum. So what we do is we bake the system literally bake it. So we um, put lots of heaters around it and then we cover the entire thing with tinfoil. 
to keep everything hot. And then we heat it at 150 degrees for um, a period anywhere between a day or two up to a week. And that drives off the water. We pump and pump and pump, drives off the water. So then we cool it down. We get a much, much better pressure. So that's that's the environment that these experiments, let me show you just what's happening here in terms of manipulation of those atoms. Each blob you see here is a single silicon atom. It's in an ultra high vacuum, it's a very low temperature, but we bring the tip in and we do the process I showed you over here. Uh, sorry. And now you can see the atoms are being, their configuration is being changed. And we can do that on an atom by atom basis. We, of course, were not the first to do this. I've got to stress that in terms of manipulating atoms. We were the first to do it on this particular silicon surface, but um, the it really was um, a group uh, led by a guy called Don Eigler who pioneered atomic manipulation experiments of this type. I've got this guy, Charles Babbage, up here. Um, some of you might be familiar with Babbage in that Long before we had electronic computers, we had mechanical computers, something called a difference engine, which Babbage uh, in, um, really worked hard on. The other person who made a, a big, big contribution to the extent where many call her the first computer programmer was Ada Lovelace. And there's this beautiful um, um, quote from her where she draws out the links between information and between between the information and the physical world, which is why I've got this it from bit, bit from it phrase up here. In enabling mechanisms to combine together general symbols in successions of unlimited variety and extent, a uniting link is established between the operations of matter and the abstract mental processes of the most abstract branch of mathematical science. I really love that. That link between the sort of philosophical esoteric idea of information and the fact that, well, if we have information, we've got to store that physically and we've got to manipulate it physically. And that's what she's bringing out there, you know, a long, long time ago. That's incredibly perceptive, incredibly influential and incredibly prescient. Um, so the other thing you can do, I'm just giving you a little flavor of the type of atomic manipulation experiments we've been involved in, is you can coat that silicon surface with hydrogen atoms. And again, we did a, a, a 60 Symbols video on this a few Christmases back, um, whereby we use this technique to make a very, very small Christmas tree. Um, but the idea here is you coat the surface, you coat each silicon atom with a hydrogen atom. What that does is it really lowers the reactivity of the surface. Every silicon atom now has got um, is bonded to four things. Silicon's valence is four. It likes to have four bonds. So in this case, this silicon atom is bonded to one, two atoms below in the layer below, and then one neighboring atom. And then its final bond is tied up with hydrogen. So that means this is a very inert, very passive surface, uh, not chemically reactive at all. And in fact, you can you can um, operate on this surface for very, very many months in vacuum and it will stay very, very clean. What you then can do, however, is you can bring the tip in of the microscope and where these X's are, um, basically inject electrons. And what that does is those electrons vibrationally heat up the silicon hydrogen bond. You for those of you who've done some quantum mechanics, you have done the simple harmonic oscillator almost certainly. You remember that for the simple harmonic oscillator, we have a ladder of um, equally spaced energy levels. That's effectively what we have here for this chemical bond. We um, inject electrons and they um, move the system up, increase its energy along that ladder of um, vibrational states up until the point where the hydrogen dissolves, comes off the surface. And then we see an increase because the surface becomes a little bit more conducting when the hydrogen is removed. We see an increase in the probability for electrons to tunnel, and therefore we see a bright spot in the image. So that's what Morton, in this case, um, painstakingly did these experiments at room temperature in this case. Um, so he, first of all, dissolved this line of, of um, hydrogen atoms, then moved, did another line, then moved, did another line, up until the point where he got this um, four by four array of atoms. He was always very, very upset that he couldn't get this one over the other side. It's very interesting at the um, 
the bond in this case, the, the absence of the hydrogen leads, just like we have holes in a semiconductor, we have electrons and holes in terms of doping a, a semiconductor. It's a little bit like that in that you've got an absence of um, a hydrogen atom. And that's what gives you rise to this bright feature, this dangling bond. But that dangling bond can diffuse just like uh, 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 an atom on the surface can. And um, it it just every time he tried to push it back, it wanted to go this side just because of the potential it felt. But still, you can see it's a pretty good array of um, uh, single atoms, single missing hydrogen atoms. Here, these rows you can see in the background, those are the uh, um, silicon rows. Um, so th these are these hydrogen passivated rows. And they are separated by a little less than a nanometer, just to give you a, a, an idea of scale. OK. Again, I want to stress, of course, I'm presenting this work, but, you know, worldwide, many groups are working on this. And if you're interested in this stuff, and it's really fascinating stuff. Some of the other groups who have used this hydrogen um, depassivation to fabricate uh, um, atomic scale devices, Indeed, you know, not just atomic scale patterns, but devices. Um, the the work is really, in terms of the person who first springs to mind, who's really taken this technique and run with it, is Michelle Simmons, who's at University of New South Wales in Australia. And she is leading a massive program of work in terms of the development of a solid state quantum, compu quantum computer. And they rely heavily on this hydrogen passivated surface and patterning of that surface with scanning probes, which you can see the patterns here, again, created using scanning probes to de develop single atom devices. It's um, There are a lot of interviews with Michelle online. There are a lot of videos with her. It's well worth spending a little bit of time um, looking up Michelle Simmons and her work. Here's, um, uh, let me see, this second reference, this 2012 reference, wow, a decade ago, is where they if I remember correctly, is where they looked at um, the extent to which Ohm's law can be extrapolated down to the atomic level. The person who actually invented this technique is this guy, Joe Lighting, um, and the seminal paper on that, the pioneering paper on that is goes back to 1995 from Joe Lighting's group. Um, the other group that's making, or well, a couple of groups, um, there are a number of other groups, but... Um, key people that spring to mind. Bob Walco's group at the University of Alberta. Um, well, we're taking a look at Bob's work as well. They are doing phenomenal work. I had the um, pleasure and honor to spend a week. Um, it was meant to be two weeks, but a, a week's visit, uh, a research leave at Bob's group at the University of Alberta in Edmonton in, in Canada. Um, back just before the first lockdown here in the UK. So it was March 2020 and worked closely with Roshan here and uh, Talina, who are very, very talented researchers. And they have been developing, obviously in collaboration with Bob, they've been developing and creating basically logic devices based on single uh, electrons, single dangling bonds, and controlling the charge state of those and using that to do um, information processing. Here in the UK, one person who's really driven this is uh, Stephen Schofield at University College London, the Na London Centre for Nanotechnology. And they've been looking at, Stephen and his group a while back and continue to do this, have been looking at artificial atoms and artificial molecules created using this, this technique. Uh, this is, if, again, for those of you interested in this, I, I recommend this video. As you can see, Atomic Scale Manufacturing, the Path to Ultimate Green Technologies. This is Bob Walco. It's a TEDx video from, oh, yeah, a couple of years back. Uh, well, worth a, well worth a watch. So before I get on to the, the teaching, let me see just what time it is, 10 to 10. Okay, before I get on to the, the teaching aspects and how this all bleeds and how this feeds into quantum mechanics. One thing I should point out is that I've told you about when it works. And this instrument, the scanning probe microscope, is absolutely wonderful because it not only allows you to see individual atoms, it allows you to move them, and it also allows you to do spectroscopy of them. It's a phenomenal instrument. The problem is the key bottleneck, the key frustrating aspect of the instrument is exactly the thing which gives it its power, and that's the tip. 
And Sam here, during his PhD, and since then has worked on looking at the influence of the tip. Many, many groups, again, have looked at this. It's an essential part of the, the scanning probe microscope. So the probe has been studied in many, many ways, but it's still something we struggle to get right. The way we create a tip, I guess I should have told you this before, is we take a piece of tungsten wire. It's not always like this, but this is the most common way. Um, take a piece of tungsten wire, you electrochemically etch it, so you put it in a solution of sodium hydroxide, and you etch it down to a sharp point. You then take that tip and you put it into your that sharp piece of wire and you put it into the microscope. If you're very, very, very lucky, and I mean very lucky, then you might see atoms with that tip. Almost invariably, the first time you put the tip in, it doesn't work. And so then you go through a process of trying to improve it. And you first of all start by touching it off the sample to try and rearrange the atoms at the end of the tip, or you apply a voltage pulse. So the voltage for a scanning tunneling microscope is, is quite small. You can run it with a battery. And in fact, there are good reasons why you, it might be worthwhile running the, the, the tip sample junction with a battery. But it's only off the order of a few volts. So the, the voltage between the tip and the sample is off the order of, of, say, anywhere between a few tens of millivolts up to, say, four volts. So that's a relatively small voltage. However, if you think about it, that's four volts over roughly a nanometer. That's four gigavolts per meter. That's a huge electric field. And that can rearrange the atoms at the tip. And sometimes we use that, uh, we exploit that effect by applying a voltage pulse. So increasing the voltage, therefore increasing the field, therefore trying to get the atoms to rearrange. It also represents quite a high current density as well. But if that doesn't work, then we'll crash the tip even in even further and we'll drag it across the surface. We'll wobble it, around, wobble it around. We'll do anything to get atomic resolution. And the problem is, although you can see the surface, you're seeing that surface through, in effect, the lens of the tip. Every image is a convolution between your imaging um, instrument and your object. So if you use a telescope, then, and you look at it at a distant star, we have something called the point spread function, which tells us how much, you know, we're not going to get perfect resolution of that star. The microscope itself is going to have a finite resolution. We have something called a point spread function that allows us to account for that. With a, a scanning probe microscope, it's a lot more difficult because it's not just like it's a, it's not just a blurring of the image. Depending on the atomic structure at the end of the tip, that completely changes the um, where the where the electrons are changes the charge density, and it's really the overlap of the um, electron orbitals at the tip and the electron orbitals at the surface. That's fundamentally what's given us our image. So here we have a tip that is terminated with a single atom, and here we have a tip which is terminated with a single atom. But for this particular case, due to the arrangement of the atoms, the maximum in the charge density. So we're looking at the probability density here. Effectively, the maximum in the charge density is pointing away, is, is almost orthogonal to the surface. Whereas here it's it's exactly as we'd like it in terms of it's pointing down. This orbital, in terms of its spatial orientation, is pointing down and therefore interacts strongly with the surface. These type of things are very difficult to account for. And even in this first uh, first example of atomic manipulation, you can see these tip artifacts. So here, here's the nice image at the end where the atoms look round. Here, however, you might be able to see the shadow. You see there's a shadow to one side. It actually looks to me like a double shadow. So you've got the, the atom itself and then you've got this shadow. Now that shadow arises from the tip itself because we don't have a perfect structure. We call this effect a doubling effect or a tripling effect or a multiple tip effect. It means that more than one atom at the end of this, at the tip is contributing to the image. And how do we fix that? Well, what we do is we bring our tip over here, away from the, the area we're working on. We touch it gently into the surface and we try to rearrange the atoms. That might work. It might make the tip worse. And then something that you've been working on for maybe 12 hours you wreck the tip and you can't find that area again and it can be frustrating. So when it works, it's amazing. When it doesn't work, it's very frustrating. And I'm not, I'm not going to go into this, but we've, uh, there are a few groups across the world now doing this. We've um, had for the last decade or so, 
been trying to automate this process of improving the tape using a, a range of machine learning strategies. And Oliver Gordon here, who's uh, very recently completed his PhD and is now going off to work um, outside of academia, he'll be very sorely missed. Um, he's worked very hard to develop a number of techniques that allow um, machine learning systems to, first of all, identify and classify um, what sort of image we have. We as humans are pretty good at identifying patterns. Trying to train an automated system to identify patterns robustly is very, very tricky at times. Um, but we're now at the point where it can indeed do that. So here, this is the confidence that the um, artificial machine, the artificial neural net, the machine learning system has in terms of various different types of atoms. So here you can, oh, sorry, various different types of images. So here you see bad blurry. And so here you can see, I hope you can see the individual atoms, and it's doing a pretty good job of working out that it's seeing atoms. Then even here, it loses resolution at this point, but still you can see there's a vague hint of atoms and it's the overall average confidence in, in seeing atoms has dropped, but it's still pretty good. And then here, finally, it loses atomic contrast entirely and the bad blurry classification shoots up and the atom atomic classification shoots down. So the next step in that, and something we're working on, again, a number of groups are working on this too, is to embed this in what's called a reinforcement learning system, whereby we train the microscope system itself to prepare the tip. It learns from us. That's trickier than um, we first, we knew it was going to be tricky. We didn't, um, unfortunately, anticipate just how tricky it is and just how difficult it is to come up with a reliable reward strategy so that the, the, the system is getting the right, um, being pushed in the right direction. Let's put it that way. But we're making progress and we're getting there. And when it works, it's lots of fun. This is, uh, again, depassivation on hydrogen passivated silicon. This is something we just did for fun last year where we um, got this, the microscope to play notes and crosses against itself so um, or against a human competitor. So just using those type of um, machine learning strategies, um, artificial learning strategies uh, that have been used, for example, to get um, computers to play video games and arcade games like Super Mario or whatever and uh, outperform humans by many, many orders of magnitude. Okay. Let me bring in the, the let me see what time it is now. Okay, it's five to, uh, my time is five to 10. I'll just spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes and it, I'm going to try and get you actively engaged now um, and ask you a few questions and make sure that the online polling works. The great thing with scanning probe microscopes, as I said, is they give you a map of the probability density. So experiments that, you know, very up to very recently were thought outside, were always thought to be sort of philosophical thought experiments, or we can do those, we can do those in the lab now. And here's my favorite, uh, image in science of all time, the garish colors notwithstanding. But here what we have, and many of you are probably familiar with this, we have a ring of ion atoms on a copper surface, and they've been moved in place by the tip of the scanning probe microscope. So you can, you can use the scanning tunneling microscope in two modes. You can keep the tip reasonably far from the surface. You're still getting a tunnel current, but you're not interacting heavily with the, with the surface, and you can form an image. Then you can push the tip close towards the surface so you get a strong interaction with the atoms at the surface and push them or pull them or slide them or prod them or poke them or do whatever you want to do. And then you can form structures atom by atom just like this. What's amazing about this is not the fact that they've made the ring. That, 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 okay, that is, of course, amazing. But what's even more amazing is that if you look, it's like you dropped a stone in a puddle or in a pond, you're seeing the ripples of the probability density, you're seeing the uh, standing wave formation, you're seeing basically an eigenstate or eigenstates of this particular quantum well, this particular circular box for the electrons. 
And you can make, and this is all from um, Agro's group, um, driven by a guy called Mike Cromie, who again, is a huge leading light in scanning probe microscopy. Um, and you can form triangles, squares, you can form a wide range of different things. This is from our own work. Um, and again, you don't have to make these structures. You don't have to make these artificial structures. Even if you have... Um, just naturally occurring defects and impurity at a surface. This is again this copper 111 surface. You can see the scattering. It's it's amazing. You can see these waves. You can see um, how the waves are scattered. The electron waves are scattered at the surface um, and at steps. So here is uh, again from our work, but lots and lots and lots of other groups have done this. I need to stress that, including all the way back in 1993, the first group to do this was another IBM group, um, uh, Hasegawa and Fade Navaris, and they first looked at um, scattering from steps. And you can see standing wave formation. You can see the electron waves confined in this, this, this narrow terrace. Here's one atomic terrace, then there's a step, to this atomic terrace, and then there's another atomic terrace. You see steps everywhere at the atomic level. Or alternatively, and this is something we've been doing very recently, it's a lot of fun with that um, high magnetic field instrument, though this is without the magnetic field on that I mentioned. You can also find natural at this particular surface. This is a gold 111 surface. It means its symmetry is got this triangular-like symmetry. So if you hunt, you can find little triangles just like this, but we didn't have to do any work in building this. It just forms naturally. And then you can probe the eigenstates within this particular well, uh, uh, simply by um, changing the voltage between the tip and the, the sample. That changes the electron energies you have access to. And then you can map out the eigenstate density as a function of energy. Just like you cover and think about in um, undergraduate quantum mechanics. So that's the, the 1993 paper from Cromie and Eichler, was, um, published in Science, well worth a read. Um, but it, much more recently, this is 2019, there is this beautiful paper um, coming out of Stefan Falsch's group in Berlin, in Germany. And this is effectively the 1D infinite potential well of course we can never really have an infinite potential well in reality but it's a reasonable approximation in that it's a very what we call hard wall potential and they've arranged 30 atoms in a line to form a 1d particle in a box uh, system and now they're mapping out the probability density using the stm you can see the red represents high the blue represents low probability density and hopefully this will ring a bell with all of you. And look at the n equal to one, n equal to two, n equal to three, n equal to four, etc. States. We start off with our lowest energy eigenstate, where anti, sorry, nodes at each end, anti node in the middle. Then we have an um, node in the middle, anti node in the middle, node in the middle. You know this. I'll be um, showing you more examples of this very very soon. But this is the type of um, ability we have to manipulate the quantum world now. Um, similarly, you can do things like just measuring directly off the image. For those of you who've done a little bit more advanced quantum um, physics in terms of thinking about dispersion and how the energy of these electron waves relates to the um, wave number, i.e. k is equal to 2 pi over lambda. You now can just measure this off the image directly. You can take your STM image. You can literally use a ruler, measure the wavelength of the electrons, turn that into a wave number. Or alternatively, you can take your image and Fourier transform it to go from real space to reciprocal space to K-space. And then you can just map this out. And this is some um, very, very rough and ready, um, just again over the weekend, something I threw together um, for colleagues here, but I thought I'd include it now because it's, it's quite interesting. You can measure the dispersion, the E versus K relationship for electrons. Traditionally, the way you do that is to use a technique called angle resolve photo emission. So it's the photoelectric effect. You're sending photons in, you're getting electrons out. If you measure both the energy of those electrons coming out and the angle at which they're leaving the surface, that will tell you about the momentum. And then you can translate that into an E versus K diagram. That's what this diagram here is in terms of the... Um, the the contrast here, this uh, blue scale map, um, where this 
is the dispersion of those um, surface state electrons measured using this technique. The orange points here are basically just measured. All I did was measure the wavelength of the electrons, invert it or go 2 pi over that wavelength to get the, the wave vector and then plot that and fit a parabola to it. And you can see that you can directly see those, those waves and directly get the wave number in from the DSTM image. So compared to where quantum mechanics was 30, 40 years ago, compared to where many of the classic textbooks on quantum mechanics were written, there's it's just another world. It really is another world. But, and now this is where the impact on teaching starts to play a role. The problem remains this, despite the fact that we've now got this incredible opportunity, we've got these incredible results um, and this body of work probing the quantum world. So stuff that wasn't tangible, something that wasn't within the realms of experiment, now very much definitely is within the realms of experiment and is in many cases routine. Those measurements of dispersion, I said, are not some new results. You know, those have been done by many groups across the world 20 years ago. Um, it's been done. And in fact, that paper from 1993 that I referred to with Hasegar and Averis, that they were measuring dispersion already then. Yet, despite the fact that we've got this interest, we've got these insights, deep insights into quantum mechanics through the scanning tunneling microscope. This is what we see time and time again. Um, common misconceptions regarding quantum mechanics. This is all about undergraduate and indeed postgraduate quantum mechanics. Framing difficulties in quantum mechanics. Overcoming misconceptions, that's a word that crops up time and time again in quantum mechanics. Student misconceptions, there we go. Assessing and improving student understanding of quantum mechanics. Student difficulties in learning quantum mechanics. So despite these massive advances in research and in visualization of these quantum systems, that doesn't seem to be translating into a better understanding for students. One of the issues is this. There's this famous phrase you might have heard, which is don't get yourself too hung up on the philosophical issues surrounding quantum mechanics. Just shut up and calculate. Usually that's attributed to Feynman, and I will be quoting Feynman soon because as physicists, we're contractually obliged to quote Feynman every single day. But it's actually that this particular quote is not due to Feynman. It's due to almost certainly due to this guy, David Merman, who is also a big name in quantum mechanics. And that's a bit difficult because... If you're just focusing on the shut up and calculate, you know, fine if you can do expectation value integrals, you know, fine if you can do tricky Fourier transforms. But if you don't understand how that relates to the quantum world, then you're doing mathematics, you're not doing physics. And this, you know, it's always uncomfortable to disagree with Feynman, but I'm going to really heavily disagree with Feynman because one of the issues with teaching quantum mechanics is that students come to it having been told over and over again, well, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. Nobody understands quantum mechanics. It's incredibly conceptually difficult. You've just got to do the maths and get on with it. And then here's another example. Things on a very small scale behave like nothing that you have direct experience about. They do not behave like waves. They do not behave like particles. They do not behave like clouds or billiard balls or weights or springs or like anything that you've ever seen. No, that's not true. Here's the quantum corral. The, 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 the circular particle in a box that I that, that beautiful image from Cromie and Eigler et al. And inside here, we see the eigenstate density. That's a standing wave. It's a standing wave for the electrons. It's uh, um, uh, it's an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. It's therefore stationary, and it's a um, beautiful image. It's a Bessel function. That's how we describe this. We've got circular symmetry, and therefore we've got a Bessel function. Here, this is um, the standing wave that's formed in a coffee cup. We're actually vibrating this from below with a loudspeaker. But it's mathematically, it's exactly the same function. It's a Bessel function. Moreover, the only thing that connects these two these two images, this is at room, well, okay, whatever temperature the coffee happened to be at, I think it was pretty cold at this stage. So let's say it was a room temperature. Coffee's obviously a liquid. This length scale, I don't know, this is what, 10 centimeters across, something like that, off order 10 centimeters across. I don't know how big a coffee cup. Yeah, maybe five to 10 centimeters. Let's say something like this. This is 10 nanometers across, okay? Moreover, this is at a temperature of a few degrees above absolute zero in an ultra-high vacuum. This is in a room, 
at room temperature. Um, moreover, this is a solid system in that we've got ion atoms on a copper surface. And yet, mathematically, it's exactly the same pattern. Because what we're dealing with here, what quantum mechanics ultimately is, is a physics of waves. And we're dealing with the interference and scattering of those waves. And it's very difficult as a scanning probe microscopist to sit in front of the microscope every day, see these images come up, see these waves everywhere, and not get very heavily drawn towards the wave mechanics side of the, the divide. There's the wave mechanics and there's matrix mechanics. Now, they are completely equivalent ways of looking at quantum mechanics. But sometimes there's a bit of um, dispute and debate about the two. But here, you know, contrary to what Feynman said, this is, we have got a very, very um, mundane example of this type of physics cropping up in the real world. So it's not that like nothing you have direct experience about. Many of us have direct experience of coffee and tea, and we can take that experience and port it across to these systems. Similarly, and this is what you do in um, right starting off with quantum physics, you're thinking about particle in a box in terms of standing waves on a string. And that's an entirely valid way to do it because ultimately you're thinking about Fourier analysis. You're thinking about Fourier modes. You're thinking about wave interactions, just as you do at the classical skills. So you've ported down your classical intuition down to the quantum level. And that's what we need to do is to take that intuition because you can build up an intuition for quantum mechanics. It doesn't have to be we just do the maths and we forget about what it all means. That's not true. And we have Fourier to thank for that. And this is a beautiful quote. Mathematics compares the most diverse phenomena and discovers the secret analogies that unite them. I'm going to shut up very soon. I know I'm running out of time. I, I really want to try and do a couple of pingo thing, um, of the polling questions, and that's that's how I'll finish. But this is, a, I hope many of you are familiar with Fourier because... This is the classic advice to any physicist. If you can't think of anything else to do, try Fourier transform and everything. I've certainly used that throughout my career, as have many others. This um, is John Barrow, who's a cosmologist who unfortunately passed away a, a couple of years ago. But it's a brilliant quote, a brilliant, brilliant quote. So I've spent, um, as I mentioned right at the start, I kicked off teaching our quantum world module. If you're interested, I can send you the links to the, the, the videos. I can send you the links to the notes and send you the links to various simulations if you're interested. Um, and that's been a fun experience for me. I've really learned a lot about um, intuition and um, conceptual understanding and trying to teach conceptually challenging um, uh, problems and concepts in physics. And one thing I've been focused on is trying to always couple it. There you can see the image. This is the thumbnail for one of the, 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 the introduction videos for the course this year. You can see I'm trying to embed as much of that experimental data as possible to help students really get beyond that. Well, I'm just going to do the maths because I can't really understand it all. Does that mean that we understand all of quantum mechanics? Of course not. There are massive conceptual difficulties. You know, we still don't fully understand uh, the, the double slit experiment. And that's that's conceptually challenging and it's something we don't fully understand. But that doesn't mean we don't understand anything. We understand a great deal, particularly if we think of it in terms of Fourier analysis. OK, so I want you to go to that link. So this is where we're going to do a little bit of interactivity just over the last um, couple of minutes while I, um, just to finish this off. So if you could please go to that link. I'll leave that there for uh, 30 seconds or so. So you've got it. So it's 535246. If you go to that link, nothing will probably be happening right now because I'm not running the simulation. I'm not running the polling. Um, it will come alive um, when I start running the polling, but just go there for now. Okay, so our first question is this. I just want to make sure that, that, that it's working. So I'm going to ask you a very easy question. There are only three questions. I hope you'll find that the last one might be a little bit challenging, but I hope this one and the next one you'll find quite straightforward. Just let me know if you've taken an introductory co course in quantum physics. It's a very simple yes or no. So I'm going to set, start the, um, the polling now. I go here. I go to survey execution. Dot. And I will start a question from the catalog, which is question one. So just this is a yes or no. Have you done, uh, where is it? There we go. And I'll just give you 30 seconds to 
I'll stop and rerun it. Oh, stop. Okay, repeat. I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay, so I just want you to answer uh, yes or no to that, that question. Okay. Except I'm seeing zero participants. Okay, maybe it's not going to work. Okay. Okay, I've seen one participant. So maybe this won't be particularly helpful. Okay, which is a shame. It would have been it would have been nice to just do this. Um so if if this is not going to work, let me talk through um where one of the 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 key issues is and I'm going to use uh, um, simulation I put together, um, and the the title of this talk is is taken very minor adaptation of this. The particle in a box is not simple from all the way back in 1976, and there's lots of very interesting things about the particle in a box. Would it be nice to do the pingo thing? But that's okay if it's not working. It's not working. So this is particle in a box. And I'm going to reset it. And what we have is it's going to start off in a state that looks like this, where we've got the first eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, so the lowest energy resonance, the n is equal to 1, the n is equal to 2, and then 2 times the n is equal to 3 resonance. So students over here, at least, Nottingham, are always very surprised at what happens. So I'm going to run that. So what we have is our quantum system evolving in time. So what we're effectively doing is plotting the solution to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for that system, where we've got the first eigenstate, the second eigenstate, and twice the third eigenstate. That's, that's our overall quantum state. Question now is, what happens when I measure energy? So let's say I measure energy. I know you're not doing the pingo thing, but think about it. Before I press this button, if I make a measurement of energy, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, am I sharing? Maybe I'm not sharing this, the right window. Can you see anything? I can't hear you. Am I talking to myself? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are here. Can you see? Can you see the um, the simulation running? Yes. yes. So okay, you can. So you can see the particle about. You can see the. Um, can you see the animation? Uh, no, you can't. I can see that myself now. So let me stop sharing that and share the other window. So let me share, share screen. Uh, I'll share entire screen. Now, can you see it now, the animation? Yes, sir. Now yes, it's, 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 it's That's it. Okay, that's good. Um, so what we have is, as I said, we have this quantum state. So we have the first eigenstate, the second eigenstate, and twice the, the third eigenstate. And it's just one dimensional particle in a box. Now, before I press energy, I want you to predict. Just You can do it in your head. You don't have to tell anybody. But predict what's going to happen when I measure energy. So let me do that. I'll measure energy. So we get that. I'm going to restart again. Same thing again. I'm going to measure energy. And we collapse it into an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. That's for energy. The interesting thing is, and the question I'm going to ask you, and the question I wanted to ask via Pingo, let me try and get it into the first eigenstate. So there's the first eigenstate. Question that a lot of students really struggle with because they think of the particle in a box. Oh, here we go. Here's my very simple. Um, model if you can see my camera too often students think of the particle in a box like this it's entirely the wrong way to think about it as a as a particle moving in a box by far the much more appropriate way to think about it is as waves on a string so this is our lowest energy eigenstate then the question is what's the most probable value for the momentum and lots of students struggle in that because they keep having this idea of something moving back and forth Think about that before I show you the answer. I'm about to show you the answer. 
So what is the most probable value for momentum for the lowest energy eigenstate of the 1D particle in a box? Zero. Because to go from the position representation to the momentum representation, we Fourier transform. If we Fourier transform this, remembering that outside the box at zero, we get this, which is peaked at zero, which means the most probable momentum we can measure is zero, which seems very, very counterintuitive if your picture of the particle in a box is a particle literally bouncing around in a box. So it would have been nice to, to explore that through Pingo. It's a shame it didn't work. But one thing, one message I want to leave you with, well, two messages I want to leave you with. First of all is that I, I have, analytical maths is great, but in terms of quantum physics, there aren't that many problems that we can solve analytically. And therefore, we have to rely on computers a lot. And there is a great advantage to using coding to develop an understanding. Because if you can code something, it means you have a fairly deep understanding of it. It means that you can convert it to an algorithm. And that, to do that, you need to have a deep understanding of it. That's the first thing. And the other thing, and it's really been the theme throughout this, this presentation, is there is so much experimental work out there. Um, that means that all the Gedanken experiments from you know decades ago are no longer no longer Gedanken experiments. They're, they're real world experiments, and we can measure and map probability density in the lab. And what we need to do as instructors, what we need to do as teachers, is to start building a lot more of that in and get away from this shut up and calculate um, idea. Okay, I'm really sorry for going over time. Thank you so much for your attention. It's a shame that the Pingo thing didn't work, but I hope that you got something out of this anyway. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, and I will stop sharing my screen now. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Th thanks a lot. And it was really much in informative. So now some questions from our side. I'm just showing it on the screen. Uh, so the question asks, does STM provide the idea uh, atomic size? That's a really good, really good question. So we can, yes, it absolutely does, because we can see those individual atoms. We can um, map out atoms at a surface. We can get right down to the atomic level. You always, as I said, you always have to remember that you've got a convolution of the tip and the sample. So if you're if basically you've got one atom imaging another. So this atom is just as important as this atom. So you have to make sure you take account of just what the tip is doing before you try and get some idea of the, the, uh, the extent of the atom. Now, when you say the atomic size, that's an interesting question in itself, because how do we define atomic size? In a crystal, we would say, what's the best um, measure of atomic size? Well, it's sort of the interatomic inter separation. If for an isolated atom, what are we talking about? We're talking really about the um, the extent of the electron density. And if that is, is falling off, you know, if we, for example, had some type of Gaussian electron density, then that never, okay, tails off. Um, but it's only when we get to infinity that that becomes zero. So it's a question of how do we define that spread in the overall wave function? And that's that's an interesting question. But... Does it provide a good idea of the atomic scale? Absolutely, yes. Uh, so next question, which one is better, AFM or STM or both? They both have, dis they both have their um, key advantages. So, if, for example, STM, you need a conducting sample. Um, atomic force microscopy, you don't need a conducting sample because you're measuring the, the force gradient between the tip and the sample, and then you can convert that into a force. That doesn't need a conducting sample. Um, however, if you're interested in knowing the electronic properties, if you're, for example, interested in doing the type of quantum mechanics experiments I've just been talking about, um, very, very difficult um, for atomic force microscopy to get that level of sensitivity to the variation in electron density. It's good at picking up um, the bonds between atoms. It's good at when you bring the tip in, you get a strong signal when you form a chemical bond. In terms of seeing those, those modulations in electron density, AFM is perhaps not as good, although there's been a paper very recently, um, just last year, which has shown that you can use AFM to, to see those, those quantum states. Um, but they have, they're, they're complementary in, in many ways. Um, we tend to use both together. 
so you can um in it's pretty well i wouldn't quite say routine but it's very very common these days in that what you do is you have um a tuning fork sensor a tiny tiny quartz tuning fork you put your tip on the end of that sensor so here's the here's the tuning fork sensor and the tips on the end that means you can do both stm and afm in parallel and that's very powerful Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, one more question. Uh, is there any kind of surface which cannot be analyzed using STM? Great question. Um, yes, uh, quite a few surfaces can't be analyzed using STM, particularly those which are insulating. You need to have enough electrical conductivity so you can uh, get a tunnel current. If you don't have that, for example, if you have a salt crystal, tip's just going to crash in. It's going to try and find a tunnel current. And it's just going to crash in. Um, moreover, what you you may have noticed that all the surfaces i talked about are flat they're atomically flat and that's what we like the problem is if you have a three-dimensional a very rough surface so for example if you have uh you know a, a biomolecule a three-dimensional biomolecule which has got lots of floppy groups and is quite um uh, in terms of its conformation, very complicated. That's next to impossible for scanning probe microscope to um, probe. There are groups working on trying to do exactly that type of thing, but it's very, very difficult to get accurate measurements for three-dimensional objects. So we much prefer two dimensions. So one last question, I think this is from my side and like out of curiosity, I'm just asking. So uh, my question is, other than Heisenberg uncertainty principle, is there anything else in the universe which is absolute? That's an interesting question. It depends on what you define by absolute. So I would say as um, compared to mathematics, science isn't about absolutes. Science is not. We don't prove. I, I continually stroke out in student work when it says this experiment proved this. No experiment proves anything. Science is about a better and better and better guesses. So it's, it's a process of induction rather than deduction. Of course, you can have the mathematics that you can deduce a particular um, uh, result and then the experimentalists can try and aim for that result. But that doesn't mean that when you get that experiment result, you've, you've done a proof in the sense of a mathematical proof. So I would say, first of all, there are no absolutes in science for start off. Um, but in terms of that, the, other, the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the reason the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is, to use your term, absolute in that sense, is not because it's just fundamentally related to quantum mechanics. It's not. It falls out of wave physics. It's simply the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in terms of position and momentum is because we treat a wave in terms of position. We can Fourier transform in terms of, of momentum or in terms of we can treat a wave in time and we can Fourier transform that in terms of frequency that's just a mathematical a solid mathematical um fact um it's not a quantum mechanical effect it's a, it's a purely effect due to, to, to wave physics so in that sense it's absolute because it's got to fall out if we treat matter like waves we've got to end up with the heisenberg uncertainty principle in terms of other things that are, let's use the word incontrovertible rather than absolute. So things that are very, very, very difficult, if not impossible to argue against rather than absolute. Second law of thermodynamics, you know, you do very, very difficult to argue with the second law of thermodynamics. Newton's laws do a pretty good job under the right circumstances as well. Um, but yeah, that's a great, great question. Great philosophical question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Th thanks a lot, sir. Uh, it was uh, really, really uh, very much informative and exciting, interesting and everything. Thank you so much, sir. We no are problem. really very humbled for your valuable talk. Thank you. It was, it was really a, amazing. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for the invitation again. Thanks to everybody there. And um, yeah, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Uh, and uh, feel free to share my email address. So if there are follow up questions, I'm very, very happy to answer those. Just get in touch. Sure, sir. So thanks for sharing your valuable time with us. Thanks a lot. Absolutely no problem. Bye. See you all. Bye. So have a great day. Uh, now I would uh, request Srimati Jaya Bhumik, Madam, Faculty Member, Department of Physics, Women's College, Agartala, to convey the vote of thanks. Thank you, Ishita. A warm and 
cherished afternoon to our most valued honorable chief guest professor philip moriarty school of physics and astronomy university of nottingham united kingdom shrimati monipa devarma principal women's college agartala dr subrata dev organizing secretary of this popular club members of organizing committee fellow colleagues and my dear students first of all i would like to propose hearty vote of thanks to our chief guest professor philip moriarty for gracing today's popular talk thank you sir for your very interesting and thought provoking address i express my sincere thanks and gratitude to our principal ma'am shrimati monipa dev verma for encouraging us always to organize such type of popular lecture seminar etc i would also like to thank dr subrata dev the organizing secretary of this popular lecture program for taking his initiative in a graceful manner and constantly working hard to make this program a successful one my sincere thanks also goes to all the esteemed members of organizing committee for their help and support throughout i would like to thank shrimati pushpa ankal assistant professor department of it for her help to organize this program successfully thank you thank you so much madam thanks uh, for your valuable talk here the popular talk series comes to an end thanks for the patience thanks for hearing thanks a lot stay connected have a great day